Matthew chapter 18. This Sunday morning, we will be studying verses 21 to 35. This morning's instructions from our Lord can really be divided into three parts. The first is the principle, the second is the parable, and the third is the promise. And all three have to do with this whole matter of welcoming back a forgiving and, and a forgiving and fallen brethren, and together they teach us one vital lesson. Here's that vital lesson. If you get nothing out of this message this morning, here's the vital lesson that verses 21 to 35 teaches us, and it's this. Because of the forgiveness we have received from the Father, it would be a great sin for us to refuse to receive that repentant brother or sister that comes to us for forgiveness. Now, beloved, I'm not going to, but I could say, let us go to the Lord in prayer. And we could end right there. That is the greatest lesson that we could learn. But I want us to see first the principle. Now, the principle is found in verses 21 to 22. Our passage begins with Peter coming to the Lord and asking a question about forgiveness. Apparently, the Lord, you remember, he had set that little boy on his knee and he's teaching this lesson. Well, apparently, he had set the little child down and allowed him to go run and play. And apparently, this allowed Peter the Apostle some time to think about what he has been hearing. And I believe that I can safely assume that the thing that the Lord had said about pursuing a fallen brother had raised some concerns in Peter's minds. I believe that Peter thought about how, with some people, it seemed like you need to constantly be keeping going after them and bringing them back and keeping on restoring them after they had wondered. And I suspect that Peter wondered how long he had to do that. One of the things that I have grown to love about Peter the Apostle is this. He is not afraid and he dares to ask the Lord the questions that the rest of the disciples and even you and I, if we were there, wish that we had the courage to ask. We see in verse 21, now let's, let's stop there for a minute. And matter of fact, let's, let me go back to Matthew 18 and look at verse 21. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times? Now, what Peter's question implies is this, that, it, it, that seven times it exceeded the bounds of graciousness to forgive someone. Okay? Peter was really, folks, he was. This time in his life, he was being very generous, and he was exceeding even the traditions of the teachers of his own people. After all, according to the rabbi's traditions, you were only required to forgive someone four times than to use a modern term, then pow, right in the kisser. Bam! They did it five times, it's over. Lights out, baby. And that's what Peter was thinking. Our rabbis say four times, I'm going to be generous, Lord, and say seven times. Peter was asking the proper number of times he should be expected to forgive a repented offender before it was just time to quit. But that's when Jesus takes the matter to a completely different level by qualifying it. Jesus said to Peter, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Jesus was not saying to Peter that he could quit ignoring a repeated offender after he had reached the 491st offense. You know, you got 491, okay, I'll, I'll forgive you up to then. But then on 491, it's over and done with. All right? 
Rather, Peter, Jesus' point to Peter was that he shouldn't even bother to count. Christ was teaching the principle that there is no limit to the number of times that you and I, that we forgive our brothers and sisters in Christ. He was teaching Peter that he was to be ready to grant forgiveness to a repentant brother or sister in Christ each and every time they came back and said, will you forgive me? Whether they were sincere or not, if they ask it, you just say, I forgive you. But now you mean it from the heart. Now, on the human level, this seems unreasonable to be ready to forgive someone without limit, and yet it is not unreasonable at all. You ready for this? When we remember that is exactly how the Heavenly Father forgave you and I. Stop for a moment and think. Hasn't there been times without numbers that we have had to, to go to our Heavenly Father and humbly ask Him to forgive us? And it isn't the first time or the second time or the fifth time or the 491st time for the same sin over and over and over again. And yet the Father never placed a limit of number of times we may come to Him in repentance and say, Father, please forgive me. There's the principle the Lord teaches to us in that passage. There is no limit of the number of times we are to forgive our brothers and sisters in Christ because our God, our Father, places no limit on the number of times, praise God, that He forgives you, that He forgives me. And I'm so thankful that He doesn't place a limit. Now, the parable, that, that's the principle. Here's the parable. Look at verse 23. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to the king who wishes to settle accounts with his slaves. And really, it goes on. Now, like most monarchs, if you read in history, most monarchs, this king had a great number of servants under him. And like most monarchs, he wished to receive an account on how his empire was being managed by him. And when he had begun to settle accounts, he was, it was, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, we don't know why. We don't know how he got into that debt. All we know is that he did. Now, a talent was a unit of weight used to measure gold or silver, okay? And each talent roughly was worth 6,000 times a normal working man's daily wages. Think of that. This man owed this king, some say, around 10,000 talents. Some biblical scholars estimate that the value of this debt to the king is in the tens of millions of dollars, and others even say it's more. But whatever the amount would be, the point is that it was a debt that the servant could not in any way, shape, form, or fashion ever come back to pay. Now, before we go any further in the parable, let me suggest this to you. That this servant serves as an accurate picture of our condition before Almighty God is sinner. We were born totally bankrupt before God. We inherited a debt of sin before God from our first parents, Adam and Eve. And, and that is exceedingly beyond our ability to ever hope to repay. If I just had to pay for the sin of Adam and Eve, I couldn't do that. But here comes a problem. I've added on to my guilt. I not only have Adam and Eve's sin to pay for, but I've got my own sin and the guilt of my own sins. And if theirs is impossible to pay back to the Lord, adding mine to it is definitely impossible to pay. And there's no way that I or you could ever pay off the debt of guilt before God 
of our sins, as the Bible tells us, folks, in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is what? Death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, Jesus goes on to show how the king acted justly, graciously, with respect to this servant. Look at verse 25. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and his children along with all that he had and, and repayment be made. So here we go. Verse 26. The slave falls to the ground. Now, he just doesn't fall to the ground in a hump. He prostrates himself out. He lays out flat of his belly with his face in the dirt before this king. And he begins to say, have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. Now that when the, the Lord, the, the, the king, ordered him and his wife and his kids and all like that and his land to be taken payment, that was a typical practice back in those days. A man would be sold into slavery to work off his debt, and sometimes the man's whole entire family would be sold off as well. So the king, this king gives order that this man, his family, and everything he owed is sold off until the debt was paid. Now this fellow in our text, because of the large debt, that meant he and his entire family would work as slaves for their entire lives. They would never pay it off. And as we read in the scriptures, what else could he do? But he, he makes this pathetic offer. Okay? He falls to his face with the, his face in the dirt, prostrate out and saying, have mercy on me, be patient, I'll pay you off. And again, beloved, isn't this like so many of us that we think if God would just be patient with us, we could work off our sin debt. We can reform our lives. No, you can't. But we can reform our lives and devote ourselves to doing good to outweigh our sins. That way, you know, the thinking is, well, my good deeds will outweigh my bad deeds and I'll get into heaven. Wrong. We think that we can earn God's favor and forgiveness beloved you cannot earn his favor or his forgiveness but beloved how can we work off our debt to sin when the as we read in romans 6 23 the wages of sin is death this man's only hope was in the mercy of the king and we saw it there didn't we the guy is laying on his face in the dirt, maybe even probably holding on to the king's shoes, crying out to him for, be patient in me. And what does it say? The Lord of that slave felt compassion. Now, notice what he did. He just didn't feel compassion for him. He released him and forgave him his debt. Again, let me go back to Romans 6.23. And isn't that our story as the Bible says? For the wages of sin is death. But I tell the group on Wednesday night in our study in, in Galatians that, that that word but is a big three-letter word. It ought to draw our attention. And it'll make our ears stand up and listen. For the wages of sin is, uh, sin is death, but... The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That little three-letter word, but, adds on what is the praise of God that we should all stand and shout and praise Him for. Now, please don't miss this, okay? In forgiving this guy and his debt, the king simply just didn't ignore it. Rather, he bore the loss himself. 
If he was to have a ledger and it had the guy's name and how much he owed, the 10,000 ta 10, talents, he would put off to the side, paid him full. Paid him full. And beloved, that's what God the Father has done toward you. Me. He doesn't just ignore our sin. He hands out the full punishment due of our sins once and for all on his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Who paid it all. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7. Paul the apostle, he's writing to that church over in Ephesus. And he says this. Now listen to these words. In him. Who's the him? Jesus. So really we can say, to make it clearer if we have to, in Jesus we have redemption through his blood. The sin debt paid in full. How? Through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And all that is required for the full forgiveness of our sins is that we confess them to God in complete faith and in the sacrifice of his son, Jesus. 1 John 1, 9 tells us this. If we confess our sins, if I look up to God, whether it was the first time back in 71 or since then, every time I've sinned, since the time you accepted Christ and every time you've sinned since then, and we say we confess our sins. We agree with God, with you, God, what I said, what I'd done, the attitude in which I said it, the attitude in which I'd done it, it was wrong. God, I'm agreeing with you. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins. And he doesn't just stop there. That's the great thing about Almighty God. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, so far, this servant story is very much like our own between us and Jesus, isn't it? But then his story takes a dark turn. Jesus goes on to speak in verse 28. Now, notice this. But that slave, the guy who had just been showed gracious, graciousness and grace, that slave went out. Notice the wording. That slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. Now, what did he do? He seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. Now, I want you to notice a couple things in that verse. Number one, notice his timing. We see that Jesus said that the man went out and he found another servant. That suggests that his actions followed immediately after the remarkable grace that he had just been shown by the king. King says, I forgive you, debt paid in full. He makes a beeline. He's thinking of this guy. He owes me a hundred. And he finds him. And when it comes to dealing with those sins, with those who have sinned against us, isn't it tragic how easily and how quickly we forget the grace that has been shown to us like this guy again? Notice number two, his concern. He sought out this fellow servant, his equal, with respect to a debt of 100 denarii. That would equally, roughly, a hundred days of the average working man's wages. Now, that is no small sum of money back then. It may not be a small sum of money today. But in time, it could have been paid off. And it was nothing in comparison to the impossible debt that he, the first guy, owed that king. Now, notice his manner. We didn't read, when we read our text earlier, we didn't read that the king 
grabbing this guy by the throat and choking him, did we? And yet he is totally graceless with respect to the one indebted to him. So his fellow slave fell to the ground. Now he's choking him. Okay, he's grabbed him by the neck and he's choking him. And he's saying, really, you could say he's yelling at him. Pay back what you owe. And his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. Those are almost the same exact word that the first guy said to the king. You would think as he's sitting there choking this guy, hands around his neck, squeezing in, screaming at him to pay him back, and this guy says, have mercy on me, I'll pay you back. You would think that hearing those words would remind him of the grace he had just been shown. But look what Jesus says in verse 30. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. It wasn't that he couldn't, beloved. It was that he wouldn't. He could have said, you know what? Man, your words that you just said to me reminded me what I just said to the king, and the king was very gracious to me for all the money that I owe him. You owe 100 denarii. Tell you what, let's make a deal. You work, pay me back so much per week, and when you get the 100 denarii paid off, we're done. But he goes, no, no, I am going to throw you, fellow servant, fellow slave, into prison. His manner toward his equal was totally out of keeping with the grace that he had been shown by the king. And this should cause us to ask ourselves if our manner toward those who sin against us is anything like the manner shown toward us by God. Now let's keep going and see what Jesus says. Look at verse 31a. So when his fellow slaves saw what, he, what had happened, they were deeply grieved. You could almost imagine them nudging each other going, can you believe that? We know he owed the king ten, you know, all those talents of money. And this guy just owes him 100 denarii. Look what he's doing to him. Good grief. Well, let me say this as a form of an application to you and I. People who know that we have claimed our claim the cross of Jesus Christ as payment for our sins and that God has graciously granted us full pardon, beloved, listen, they are watching us to see if we live in the way that, that is consistent with our profession of faith. And when they see how we then treat others who sin against us, doesn't it make them grieve as well? They may, not, they may not say, well, boy, that's just terrible. You know what they may say? They may say, well, if that's Christianity, I'm not going to have anything to do with it. Because at least when, you know, old Pete down the road, he did this to me, I just said, don't worry about it, go on. I forgive you. Our Lord says that this man's fellow slaves were, were very grieved over what they saw. And notice this, they came and reported to the Lord or the master or the king all that had happened. And then the Lord, the master of the king, after he had called him, said to him, look at verse 32, then he summons him, then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave 
in the same way that I, show, I had mercy on you? Notice this now in verse 34. And his Lord, with, unmoved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. Two things stand out there. The verdict of the man's wicked character. The king didn't call him a wicked slave when he found out about his great debt, did he? He didn't call him a wicked slave back up there. But he was declared wicked after grace had been shown to him. That is, after he had been, been forgiven this great debt by the king, but after he refused to show forgiveness to his fellow slave. And beloved, like you and I, it is deeply wicked thing for us to receive God's gracious forgiveness for our great sin and then turn around and withhold forgiveness from those who sinned against us. Second thing is the nature of the man's wickedness. The king said that he had forgiven the slave all of his debt. Why? Because you begged me. And that, beloved, listen to me, please, that is the only condition God asks of us in order to be pardoned for our sins. God himself already paid the cost for our sins on the cross. And he gave us the promise in his word that if we confess our sins, he is righteousness and faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all of our sins. Yet, when another slave begged him, begged him, with the exact same words, that man refused to have compassion on him. The principle this morning that we learn in this, in this text is that the Lord teaches in this passage is that there is, no, there is to be no limit to our readiness to forgive someone who has sinned against us. The parable he told shows us that it is a very wicked sin for us to withhold forgiveness from someone else after we ourselves have been forgiven so much by God. Now, here comes the promise, verse 35. Look at verse 35. Jesus is speaking. He says, My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. The king took the wicked slave and delivered him to the torturer until he, he could pay off all his debts. In other words, after seeing how the man treated his fellow slave, the king took back his forgiveness. Now, praise God, Jesus doesn't take back our, his forgiveness from us. Okay? Don't think that's what the Bible is saying here. That, oh, if we sin and, and God forgives us and then somebody sins against us and you say, well, I'm not forgiving old Pete because of what he did to me, that you get your salvation pulled away. No, that's not what it's saying there. Okay? When it says he took back his forgiveness, it's then that Jesus goes on to say in that verse 35, and here's the great lesson of this passage, is that it is a great sin to be one of Jesus' forgiven followers and yet be unforgiving toward one another okay and this means beloved that there are some of us listening to this message who have placed our trust in the cross of Jesus and have made a profession of faith in him alone but who have in actual fact lived for years with God's hand of judgment upon us because we have been harboring unforgiveness in our hearts to toward a brother or sister that said, I'm sorry. Now, let me close with this. Let's this morning from Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35. Let's allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts concerning the sin of unforgiveness. And when he shows us that, that we are harboring bitterness, hatefulness, whatever you want to call it, towards someone else that has asked for forgiveness, here's two things that we need to do.
First, we need to run immediately to the Father and confess that we are our wicked sins, our wicked slaves. As wicked as this man in our parable. And let us seek his forgiveness without delay. Number two, let's confess our sin to that one whom we have refused to forgive and forgive them as we have been forgiven. That's the application of today's passage, isn't it? So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Lord God, forgiveness. Forgiveness is one of the hardest things of the kingdom life. Because someone has done it to us personally. And yet, it is one of the most important. Father, I pray today that you search our hearts. And if we have bitterness, if we have hard feelings, if we have unforgiveness toward another brother or sister in Christ, I pray today, Father God, that we first ask you to forgive us of that harboring bitterness, hatefulness. That lack of being willing to forgive them. And then help us to go to them. It's difficult, but help us to go to them. And say, you know, I've been harboring bitterness or anger or hate toward you. And you asked me for forgiveness, and I didn't forgive you. Well, will you forgive me? as I forgive you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, let's stand together. Turn in your hymnal to page 294. Have thine own way, Lord. If God is speaking to your heart, calling you to do whatever, then, beloved, you just be obedient, okay? And do it. Don't put it off. Just do it. Let us sing.